Good evening and welcome to our service of college prayers at the very beginning of Trinity Term in 2021. Um, it's been an unusual couple of weeks, hasn't it? And uh, we're looking forward to the time when the days become lighter and uh, longer so we can go outside a bit more. Uh, we're very much missing you, those of you who are still resident at home. Uh, we're missing you in college and we look forward to better times when we can be reunited uh, as one community. But meanwhile, this term, in terms of chapel and music, uh, please check the term card which is on the website now for what's happening. Uh, there are lots of things happening online and a few things happening in person and we hope that we'll continue a weekly Eucharist in person in college, which will also be live streamed. So probably best to check the term cards and my Friday emails at the same time. This term for college prayers, um, I've chosen the theme of ready or not. Um, so many uh, of the stories from the Bible depict uh, characters uh, who are um, challenged and face difficult times and uh, no different to our own. So I felt that looking at those characters and uh, looking at the way they adapted to change in difficult circumstances, whether they were ready or not, um, might inspire us in this term particularly, uh, when we face still so much uncertainty. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, four characters, Moses, Daniel, Esther and God, uh, to see how they fared. Uh, obviously, God is faithful, but uh, the three other characters particularly, how do they fare in the difficult circumstances in which they faced in their own lifetime? Uh, alongside those that four mini uh, sermon series, uh, we've uh, really um, excited that we've got the Runcie sermon this term, an intercollegiate service online with the University Church, our usual service at the end of term of music and readings for Passion, Passion Tide, and in third week uh, our annual Holocaust Memorial service. So lots of really interesting uh, speakers coming up and do check out the term card on the website. As far as the chapel charity goes this term, um, it seemed um, a, a, a very good time to continue to support our local NHS services. So um, we've chosen the Oxford Hospitals Charity, which helps to transform the lives of both patients and staff in four hospitals, the John Radcliffe, the Horton General, uh, the Nuffield, sorry, is five, the Children's Hospital and the Churchill. So please do give generously if you can, uh, either in the tap and donate machine in the anti-chapel if you're in college or uh, in the Just Giving uh, link which will be uh, shown very shortly uh, by the end of the service. Um, so without further ado, we've come together as a community both virtually and in person. So let us worship Almighty God.
let us confess our sins. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus, you, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent, and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, makes me to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. I will magnify thee, O God, my King. Father and to the 
first lesson is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, beginning at the first verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Piahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal-Zaphon. You shall camp opposite it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed towards the people, and they said, What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready, and took his army with him. He took six hundred picked chariots, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites, who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them, camped by the sea, by Piahiroth, in front of Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward, but you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they will go in after them, and so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed him into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Here ends the first lesson.
Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. We say the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Light in our darkness we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we desire thy loving kindness upon this our well-loved society. We implore thy blessing on its members, who now serve thee in their several callings. Strengthen them, O Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, and as thou hast called them to thy service, make them worthy of their calling. And we pray for ourselves that we may learn here to know and to do thy will, and that through thy protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. O eternal God, the resurrection and the life of all them that believe in thee, trust in thee and serve thee, thou that art always to be praised, as well for the dead as those that are alive. We give thee most hearty thanks for our founders and benefactors, by whose bounty and charity we are brought up to religion and the studies of good learning, and particularly Samuel Radcliffe and Thomas Yates, our benefactors, beseeching thee that we may so well use these thy blessings to the praise and honour of thy holy name, that at last we, with them, may be brought to the immortal glory of the resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
May I speak in the name of the living God to his Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. This term's uh, four-sermon mini-series uh, looks at ready or not, the, that theme, um, particularly looking at three characters from the Hebrew Bible as well as God. Seeing how those three characters face times of challenge and difficulty and change with God's help, in order that perhaps we might draw some inspiration or food for thought about the times that we're living in and how we might cope with them. So today I decided that uh, we would look at Moses. So I wonder if we have a, a quick dig around in uh, our long-term memory and uh, think about Moses's biography to start off with. Well, he was almost born in secret, if you like, wasn't he? He was the son of a Levite couple, the second son uh, of Amran and Jochebed. And he was hidden, if you remember, in a basket in the bulrushes to avoid slaughter by the Egyptians on the Nile. And uh, he was discovered in this basket in the bulrushes by the daughter of Pharaoh, who had pity on him. She took him into her household and, and brought him up as her own son. And by a, a surprising twist of story and fate, um, he ended up being uh, nursed by his own mother as a favour to Pharaoh's daughter. Moses grew up in Egypt and uh, when he was an adult, uh, he saw a Hebrew, one of his own people, being beaten and he killed the Egyptian. He was beating that Hebrew and as a consequence of that, fled for his life to take refuge in Midian. And there in Midian, he married Zipporah, the daughter of a priest called Jethro, and they had two sons. Later on, uh, while he's tending the flocks for Jethro, he, at Horeb, um, hears God's voice and God reveals God's self to Moses in the burning bush, if you remember that famous story where he takes off his sandals and he's dazzled by the presence of God. And he's commissioned from that burning bush to return to Egypt, to let my people go, that's what that's what God says, to let the Hebrews out of slavery and oppression um, on God's behalf. And Moses drags his feet for a little while uh, as a, quite a sense of uh, comfort to us all, all of us who've dragged our feet in leadership positions uh, at different times. And But eventually goes back to Egypt, uh, even though he could face death, and uh, asks Pharaoh to let the Hebrew people go, the Israelites. They've been in slavery to the Egyptians for 400 years, if you remember. And for them, really, being in slavery has become normal. It's become familiar to them. It's been such a long time. But God desired their freedom. And, uh, of course, Pharaoh says no. And then God, through Moses, brings a number of different plagues uh, that you might remember from uh, your early childhood and or exciting kind of films on TV, um, locusts and uh, rivers of blood, very dramatic. And then the last plague, um, the death of the firstborn. And it's only at that stage that Pharaoh agrees to let the Israelites go. And they come to this point in, this, in the narrative that we've heard this evening, uh, read in our first lesson, where they're about to cross the Red Sea, really the Reed Sea. And um, we see that Moses is their leader. And he's faced with Pharaoh and the army coming up behind him and the sea and uh, no dry land uh, for a long way in front of him. He's between a rock and a hard place, if you like. But he, the Israelites panic and they say, why have you brought us here? We might as well go back and serve Pharaoh because we're going to die in the water, whereas at least in slavery we, we won't all die. I mean, some of us will die, but we won't all die. But Moses keeps faithful and listens to God and knows that uh, with God's help, uh, they will get through this difficulty and they will be led to freedom. So it's a time of great fortitude for Moses and great trust and obedience and reliance. He says, do not be afraid. And then low in the rest of the story, the miracle happens that uh, Moses, with God's help, parts the Red Sea. The Israelites, the Hebrews, uh, cross to the other side uh, into the wilderness and uh, to safety and freedom. 
and then obviously their water peels back and uh, one wouldn't want to be an Egyptian on that day. The Egyptians are flooded and drowned and uh, the people of Israel rejoice. So um, you might think that this is probably more than enough for one leader, but if we look at the rest of Moses' life, there are so many challenges that he led the Israelites through in the wilderness as they reached the promised land. It took them 40 years, according to the the, the narratives that we find uh, in the texts, which are pretty multi-layered, it has to say, and rather composite from traditions. And uh, Moses is presented as the ideal leader, the ideal judge, um, the prophet, the greatest prophet. Um, but in spite of that, he faces so many challenges. At so many occasions, the Israelites are murmuring and grumbling and uh, refusing to trust him and to trust God. So many times that they turn their back on God and do other things. They worship the golden calf. But Moses is uh, persistent with them. He also listens to those around him. He listens to Jethro, who tells him to appoint judges because he can't possibly take on all of this work himself. He ordains priests. He sets up the tabernacle. Moses really, um, from a secular point of view, is the, is the person who gives birth with God to the Jewish religion. Uh, if you could say that Abraham gives birth to the Jewish nation, then Moses gives birth to the Jewish religion. Um, but obviously, um, for Christians and Jews and Muslims alike, Moses is a great prophet and someone that we look to uh, for inspiration. But beyond his status as a prophet, of course, we can't fail to remember the key part of Moses' uh, commission, if you like, I would say, which is uh, his meeting with God on Mount Sinai on a number of occasions to receive the law, uh, the Ten Commandments and uh, the law beyond those uh, to give to the people. Um, this isn't Mount Sinai. This is a, it's a lovely mountain in Spain in, uh, near Bilbao. I'm sure Mount Sinai looks very different to this, but this is the picture that I've got. But, um, you know, Moses really is the giver of the law, um, the giver of Torah, and and the presence of God is with Moses. Moses uh, um, is trusted with um, the law that gives life to all people. So Moses is obviously a prophet, but he's also the giver of the law and the great teacher. But I suppose... Uh, um, the things that we can take from this are his persistence, his reliance on God, but also remembering the ways in which he promised the Israelites that even when they were hungry, they would be fed with manna in the desert. When they were thirsty, he struck the rock and the water flooded forth. They had clean drinking water. At every stage of their doubt, he provided with God's help. He even healed them from serpents by holding up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. There's so many miracles that surround his story. Well, what does this mean for us? Well, if we take this reading about the Egyptians and Pharaoh and Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea, we also look at the story that we've heard from um, Mark's Gospel, uh, which is also in uh, Matthew and Luke, um, of Jesus stilling the storm. There's a sense of two groups of people being in a situation where they're utterly overwhelmed, where they think the chaos of the waters is going to drown them, is going to endanger them. They cry out uh, in fear. And obviously in the gospel account, Jesus has command and authority over creation, divine authority. The storm is stilled. And in the story with Moses, Moses, with God's help, is God's messenger and mediator, if you like, enables safe passage for the Israelites. And there's a sense that um, God, in the end, will bring order out of chaos, will bring meaning and purpose. Now for Moses, um, the, I think the, the, the most poignant part of his biography, if you like, is that after these 40 years of wilderness wanderings, he gets to see the promised land, but he never gets to inhabit it. And I suppose there's a sense also that Moses is a sacrificial uh, character. He's willing to bear the burdens of his people. Perhaps he doesn't see the promised land because of the sins of the people. There's that suggestion. There's also sometimes a suggestion that um, for his own sins, he doesn't he doesn't see the promised land. I don't know. Um, you have to figure that one out for yourselves. But there's a similarity between the prophet of Moses and the prophet Jesus, but also obviously for Christians, for me, 
uh, for many of us that Jesus actually is God, is divine. So a difference there. But what does this mean for us? Well, I think in terms of our faith, sometimes and our spiritual lives, particularly at this time, uh, when the pandemic raises lots of questions for us and makes us think about things that perhaps we haven't thought before, that it, um, for many of us in our faith life, in our spiritual lives, in our lives of discipleship, this can also be a scary time because there are times when God is calling us out of slavery, out of old pa- patterns of behaviour, out of things that are familiar, if you like, a bit like the slavery that the Egyptians experienced, into something new, into freedom, into something unexplored. And sometimes that involves desert, involves wilderness wandering. And sometimes, many times, it involves letting go of expectations and letting go of control. So I wonder at this time, as you think about Moses, and you see also Jesus' power over creation, God's authority, is there anything at the moment in your life that God's asking you to let go of? Is there anything that God's inviting you to embrace as a new thing, even though it's a bit scary? Maybe I'd like to encourage you to to walk through those waters with God's help, to know that God will still the storm and meet you on the other side, and that God is with you, and that uh, you're called to freedom, not to slavery. Moses knows that, and so do I. And most of all, Jesus does too. Loving God, we pray for your support and guidance in these tough weeks for us all. But while here it is Hillary, in other places this is Lent term, and we are reminded of the importance of preparation. Preparation for things new and for entering your kingdom. We pray for the perseverance of our faith and trust in you, that greater things will come of the sacrifices and hardships we endure now to protect our neighbour. Loving God, we ask for the touch of your healing on those places in the world experiencing fracture and discord. We pray that justice may flow in the United States and peace reign in the hearts of men, that they will be guided by good intentions, not malice or ill intent. We pray for the triumph of democracy and freedom everywhere in the world where it is currently under threat. Amen. God of compassion, we devote our empathy and sympathy to all those who are unwell at this time or struggling at this moment. For all those who are physically, mentally or spiritually weak or poorly. We particularly bear in our hearts all those students struggling with the secondary effects of COVID and isolation. And pray for those struggling to be apart from each other during this virtual term as the number of people who have passed away as a result of coronavirus continues to rise. We ask that you enrobe their families in your love as they grieve, and we commend their souls into your eternal kingdom. Amen. Lord, we pray for the whole community of Brazenos. We pray especially for all of our finalist students, who are anxious about upcoming exams and other deadlines. And the effects of this pandemic on their studies. Give them renewed determination and confidence, Lord, that with the grace of your wisdom and the gifts of talent you bestow on us, that all of our students can continue to grow and develop into the promising, enlightened and dedicated individuals that they all aspire to be. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. The Blessing The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in peace.
Thanks be to God.